Hello everyone, uh, welcome to this webinar organized by Olea Medical. The topic of today's talk is 3D crany, an MR technique to study the extracranial course of the cranial nerves. Before uh, I go further, I want to review functionalities of Cisco WebEx. Your active participation is important during the session. Right now, I have everyone on mute to avoid background noises. Throughout uh, the presentation, I will be managing the chat functionalities and you can enter your question in the chat section. Now, I'm very pleased to welcome you all and introduce you Professor Dr. Ian Kasselman, Chairman of the Department of Radiology at University Hospital at St. John in Bruges, Belgium. Once a week, he is a head and neck consultant radiologist at the University Hospital at St. Augustinus Hospital in Antwerp and further as academic teaching activities at the University of Ghent. His main field of interest is neuroradiology and head and neck radiology. Professor Kasselman is also section editor of Head and Neck for Neuroradiology and associate editor of Head and Neck Imaging for Radiology. He has authored and co-authored over 240 scientific publications and has given over 1,000 scientific presentations in 48 countries. Enjoy the webinar. I will answer your question at the end. Professor Dr. Kassenman, whenever you are ready. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Anais, for the uh, kind introduction. And I also would like to thank Olia Medical for the possibility to show you uh, this work on 3D crani. So what we want to see is cranial nerves in their extracranial course. We all know that cranial nerves are easy to visualize intracranially and also where they leave the skull base. But once you go out of the skull, it gets quite difficult. And most often you can only see them when they are surrounded by fat. And because not all of the nerve is surrounded by fat, very often only parts of the nerve can be seen, other parts remain invisible. And the only technique we had was very often high resolution T1 and T2 non-fat sat. Thin 3D sequences to follow the nerve from slice to slice do not work in the neck because you have susceptibility artifacts. So this is what we did in the past. Here you see on the left side a lingual nerve and you see the lingual nerve going in the tongue surrounded by fat and that's why we see it here at the free edge of the myelohyoid. On the other side the nerve is thickened and you see that the fat is dirty. There is not really a high signal anymore and that's how we pick it up. So this patient had a wisdom tooth extraction. You see the cavity there and they uh, clipped also the nerve and they damage the nerve and we can see that. Of course, you can also see uh, on T1 very well little branches. And here we see the infraorbital nerve with its little branches there in the skin anterior or in the fat anterior to the maxillary sinus. Here we have the lesser and greater palatal nerve in the pterygoid process. So you can see these little nerves on very high resolution imaging, but very often then parts of the nerves are not visible. And some of these nerves you can just not see. Now, the closest we were coming to see nerves in the neck is with the cervical brachial plexus sequences and we all know that as MR neurography and there we try to see the cervical nerves and uh, often these nerves can be followed quite easy but then you get behind the clavicles you lose the signal retroclavicular and very often you have too much vascular superposition or lymph nodes that are superposed on the nerves and that make them invisible now to get rid of that loss of signal retroclavicular in the neck you can use an airplane neck cushion. We fill that with barium and we put them backwards uh, on the neck and that helps you to get rid of this signal loss in the neck. Uh, second, to get rid of the signal that is uh, from the vessels that is superimposing on the nerves, therefore you have to inject gadolinium. That's just the opposite of what most people think. They think we inject, you will have more hyperintensities that are hiding the nerve. It's just the opposite, but I will show you. And uh, with these tricks, you get already better plexus images and uh, cervical roots, but still on these images, you can't see the occipital nerves and still you can't see the nine to 10 to 11 and the 12th nerve. And the reason is because you don't have the resolution for that. So let's start with what we had and that is the cervical brachial plexus. You see here the plexus and there we lose the signal behind the clavicles, typical because you have these air 
uh, bags there behind the clavicles. And to get rid of them, just take these uh, airplane cushions, put them backward, fill them with barium, and then you get uh, much better images. And I show you that image here. Oh. Sorry for that, this one is not running automatically. But what you see here is that we now see these roots and look, now suddenly all these roots behind the clavicles come out. And also if you look in the coronal plane, you can beautifully see all these roots. Now look in this patient, we have here patient had a trauma on the left side and here you see one root which is completely bright, you see, and interrupted there. And this is the kind of resolution you already want to have. You can also see that a little branch there of the plexus on the left side. So we have a beautiful resolution but not good enough to see the cranial nerves. We see the roots, even the upper cervical roots, but not the cranial nerves. So if we want to go further, we need a higher resolution. So we will still use the MR neurography. And that is, of course, with the T2 way to 3D inversion recovery sequence with FATSAT. That's how we see these nerves, but you need more. We add a black blood pulse to it with a motion sensitized driven equilibrium. On top of it, we will need a better coil. So we will use a 32 channel head coil and put the patient, patient as high as possible in the head coil. And of course, we do that on three Tesla because you have a higher signal to noise ratio. If you do all that and you want to have that high resolution, your time runs up. And then, of course, you need other tricks like compressed sense to get the time down again. And then, of course, also use gadolinium so that you get rid of the high signals of the vessels around the nerves. And if you do all this, then you start seeing the nerves. Now, first of all, you need gadolinium. This is the same patient, the same slice, the same moment. Now, what you see here in this patient is without gadolinium prior to injection. And I want to see my nerves here. I can't see them. There is a vessel there. Now, look, all this is here uh, high. If I inject gadolinium, look at the background, look at the muscles. They get dark. I suppress the background by injecting. And suddenly I see my uh, mandibular nerve here with muscular branches over there. So another example here, I can't see my branches before gadolinium. I inject bingo. There I have my alveolar nerve and I have my lingual nerve on both sides. And the reason is that when gadolinium is injected, the vessels will be filled with that contrast. And then if you immediately start after injection, that will result in faster blood defacing, which will cause signal loss when the MR neurography sequence is used. And due to the gadolinium administration, a short lasting change in susceptibility occurs, which causes a signal drop in slow flow and veins and small vessels as well. And so you get rid of these vessels just by injecting. So it's important to inject. Now, here you see the parameters of our sequence. Uh, there were sequences that were used uh, in the past. These were most often gradient echo sequences. The problem with gradient echo sequences is that you get more susceptibility again. And therefore, the or 3 d crani is using a turbospan echo. Uh, all the details, you see isotropic 0.9 millimeter, reconstructed 0.5, time of the acquisition is 5.70. We use, of course, compressed sense and so on. And that you can all find in the publication on the sequence. Uh, we had a technical report in EGNR and we had a review paper on the technique in the British Journal of Radiology. So uh, once we use that now with the head coil and on three Tesla and a higher resolution, this is what you can see. And the first clinical demand came actually from the people that wanted to look at the occipital nerve for occipital neck pain. And you see that normally you have three nerves there. You have the tertiary uh, occipital nerve, the lesser occipital nerve, which have a common origin. And then you have the greater occipital nerve. And that's what we want to see. And you can see them. Look, this is the greater occipital nerve, which then passes the trapezius muscle and goes open again. You see they run medial and then make a curve and go lateral again to the surface. Here we see the lesser and the tertiary uh, occipital nerve, which have uh, a common origin uh, on the upper cervical branches. And here you can see that on a movie uh, where we can beautifully see these nerves coming. We have, first of all, uh, there the uh, that's the greater occipital nerve. And here you see the lesser occipital nerve as well. So you see that these nerves can easily be followed on that sequence. But it's of course not only uh, anatomy, we can also look for pathology. And here you see a patient that came in with C2 cervicalgia on the left side. And uh, on the imaging, you see that we see the normal greater occipital nerve on the right side. The left one is 
three times thicker and has hyper intense. And so this was the irritated nerve. And they had actually to put uh, electrodes, stimulating electrodes uh, to uh, get rid of the pain in this patient. And you see here after the surgery and the patient no longer have the pain. Here we see another example of a patient that had a trauma on the right side with the right cervical pain. And uh, we saw that we had the nerve normal on the left side, but here on the course of the greater occipital nerve, we see diffuse uh, thickening and signal change also in the surrounding tissues. And uh, in that patient, they are using now pulsed radio frequency lesioning. And it has to be repeated every six weeks because the effect lasts for four to five weeks and then the pain comes back and then they have to do it again. Of course, the surgeons want to go to the electric stimulation as well, but the patient is not ready for that yet. But you see that we can see this lesion. Another example, this patient came in with pain on the left side, and we see here the greater occipital nerve with on the left side here a thickening with a nerve sheet tumor. And you can follow these nerves in the coronal plane. You see all these nerves here. And if we go to the back, you will see here on the movie, there you have the greater occipital nerve. Here you have it, here you have it, you follow it, you follow it, and there, bingo, there you have the lesion on the nerve. And this is how we follow these nerves today in between the muscles because we suppress everything that is surrounding it. But of course, uh, this was not the initial goal. The initial goal was, can we see the branches of the trigeminal outside of the skull? Can we see the 9, the 10, the 11, the 12? Can we see these nerves outside of the skull? And uh, therefore, we need a high resolution. Uh, large lesions can hide the nerve. That's a disadvantage. Once you get a, a big lesion, you won't see the course of the nerves that good anymore. So uh, that's another challenge. And sub subtle lesions might remain invisible. Uh, but Another problem is we see new things. We see new hyperintensities, and this is pathology that was not seen previously. We couldn't see it. And now very often we come with these results and we say, look at that nerve, it's completely abnormal. But now the clinicians have to find out what they're gonna do with it. And so now they are adapting uh, pathologies and finding new ways to treat these patients. Now, but let's start with the anatomy. Now, if you look for the anatomy of the trigeminal nerve, and here we look at the mandibular nerve, you can see that here we see the inferior alveolar nerve completely in the mandible. So the mandible is black, but you see how beautifully you can see the nerve. And we suppress the vessels, so it's not the vessels we are seeing. And if you are looking here uh, on this image, you can see that we have the inferior alveolar nerve, and on the inside, on both sides, we have the lingual nerve. And you can beautifully see that here on that video. Here we see the inferior alveolar nerve. Look at it, in the mandible, beautifully followable on both sides. And now on the inside, you have the lingual nerve. Lingual nerve to the hyoid goes into the tongue and you see how far we can follow it into the tongue if the patient is not moving. Here it goes, hyoid, and there into the tongue. So on both sides, you see the lingual nerve into the tongue uh, uh, running. So uh, these branches are visible, but there are other branches. This is the inferior alveolar nerve, and this is the lingual nerve, which we have here on the left side. Now, the, they come together and form the mandibular nerve. And from there, we have the muscular branches to the buccal nerve muscle and to the masseteric muscle, it's the masseteric branch. Here we get Meckel's cave, and there you have the maxillary nerve becoming the infraorbital nerve on both sides. If we go back down on the left side, here you see the muscular uh, branches. And here, one that we didn't mention yet that goes to the back, that is the auricular temporal nerve which runs under the skull base between the muscles into the deep lobe of the parotid on the left side. So you see that all these branches are visible. Here you see that again we have the mandibular nerve, the buccal muscle branch, the masseter muscle branch, there we have the maxillary nerve, the infraorbital nerve, and here we have the ophthalmic nerve running through the orbit. And you see how uh, suddenly all these branches that we couldn't see in the past become visible. We can even see smaller branches. Here you have the frontal nerve, which gives off its lateral and medial branch, on both sides, the frontal nerve. Here, if you go a little bit lower, you can see the abduchens nerve. The sixth nerve is going to the rectus lateralis muscle in the orbit. And you can see it run here in the cavernous sinus, runs through the plexus basilaris, and then, of course, in the cistern, in the prepontine cistern, because it has to go to the lower border of the pons. Uh, here we see, again, the sixth nerve on the right side. And here we have the infratrochlear nerve, uh, which is a small branch also of the uh, 5-1, which runs uh, infratrochlear uh, and also lateral to the etmoid. Uh, that's the uh, small branch that we can pick up on both sides here. 
Now here we see that also in the movie, uh, some of these nerves again, here we have the sixth nerve, here going back to the prepontine cistern. Then we see, of course, also a bigger nerve, which is the oculomotor nerve. And we have a very small branch there going in the superior obliquus muscle. This is the trochlear nerve, which you can even see in the orbit. Here again, you see the optic, the optic nerve, the oculomotor nerve, and there, of course, we see the five one, the frontal nerve. Here you can see that on the movie. Look, this is, this, of course, the frontal nerve. This is the oculomotor nerve. This is the abducens nerve, and of course, the optic. And here we have the five two in that patient. So you see that a lot of branches are visible. Not only branches of the fifth nerve, but we can also see, of course, the branches of the seventh nerve outside of the skull. Of course, in the skull we could already see them, but look here we see the temporal bone and there you see the sixth nerve coming and you see the nerve going into the parotid gland. Here we have the tympanic portion, the mastoid portion, stylomastoid foramen, and you see you can just follow the nerve into the uh, parotid gland uh, because we suppress all the surrounding uh, signals. So also the, the facial nerve can be seen, but that's not all. We can also see the hypoglossal nerve here. And we can also see there the accessory nerve running around the jugular and to the back. Here we had the facial nerve, but here the hypoglossal look, we can follow it lateral to the tonsil. Then it runs here towards the submandibular gland and the hyoid and then into the tongue. Here we run backwards. This is the lesser and the greater occipital nerve, by the way, at the back. Uh, here we see the accessory nerve. This is the hypoglossal nerve running through the hypoglossal canal, the facial nerve. And here, of course, we have the nine, the 10 and the 11. This only one coming from below the hyoid and that's the vagus nerve. Here you see the vagus nerve coming up, running up. And then of course you will follow it down to the area, by the way, that the facial and the accessory into the jugular foramen. Only the hypoglossal, of course, uh, will go into the uh, hypoglossal canal. And the glossopharyngeal is the only one that goes medial. That was the smallest one I've shown you at the end. And this is the most difficult one to see. But you see all these nerves are visible. And here we just played with one. This is the hypoglossal nerve. And here you can see on that movie that we can see the hypoglossal nerve actually coming from the hypoglossal canal at the top here at the, the, the skull base. And from there it runs down, it runs to the hyoid and then into the tongue. And this is the whole course. By the way, this is the inferior alveolar nerve. Now here you can see that in one image, this is the complete course of the hypoglossal nerve, vertical down, running uh, behind the tonsil, then running anteriorly, running to the hyoid bone and submandibular gland area, and then into the tongue. This is the course of the, of the 12th nerve, hypoglossal nerve. Now, okay, we see all the anatomy. Now, what can we do with it? Can we also apply it to see pathology? And what we see here is that we can go for uh, mononeuropathy. So, uh, uh, this irritation, uh, dysfunctioning of the nerve that can be, be, be because of a local trauma. For instance, they do a tooth treatment, canal filling and whatever, and you get an irritation on that, then you can get a local secondary trauma or irritation of your nerve. Infection of a tooth and mandible or somewhere else in the neck, irritation by a tumor, elongation, displacement by a tumor adjacent to the nerve. Then we have the real trauma, the direct trauma to the nerve, like with wisdom tooth extraction, where they can uh, clamp also the lingual nerve and of course damage the nerve. And of course, you can also detect uh, nerve sheet tumors. They can also be present. And of course, there can be nerve involvement by adjacent tumors, for instance, perineural tumor spread and so on can also involve the nerves. Now, some examples of that. Now, here we see a patient that came in with uh, uh, sensory changes on the inferior alveolar nerve. And what we see in this patient is that he has two lesions inside the mandible on the course of the inferior alveolar nerve, two lesions that were difficult to see. We missed them actually on the routine T1 and T2 weighted sequences because you have the bone around it and it's very difficult to see them. Another example, this is a patient that had a treatment of the teeth on the right side and afterwards develops uh, terrible uh, pains in, 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 the, in the cheek and the mandible. And you see that we did an MRI, uh, T1, T2, all the routine sequences completely negative. Then we run our nerve view sequence and you see that this nerve is two times as thick as the other one and also has a much higher signal intensity. This is a neuropathy, a neuropathy secondary to treatment of the teeth. Another example, a patient with numbness of the left chin and sensory changes in the territory of the left inferior alveolar nerve. And uh, again, the routine MR sequences were completely normal. Here we see a thickened, irregular, inferior alveolar nerve on the left side in comparison to the right side. By the way, here we see on both sides a beautifully uh, well 
uh, follow a, a nerve that we can follow quite long. This is the lingual nerve on both sides, but the inferior alveolar nerve here has a problem. So in this patient, it turns out that he had a osteomyelitis of the mandible with secondary irritation and development of neuropathy of the left uh, alveolar nerve. So these are the kind of things you can see. Here we see a typical example of a patient that uh, had a wisdom tooth extraction on the left side and afterwards had a complete drop out of the lingual nerve. Now here you can see uh, that we have the lingual nerve on the right side. You can beautifully follow it here, perhaps. But on the left side, it starts higher up. So if we go another run, you will see that here we already have the lingual, but here the lingual starts just there and it's hyper intense and thicker. That's where the nerve was sectioned. By the way, just see how you can look at your anatomy. This is the inferior alveolar nerve and look how he has a duplication before he goes into the common mandibular nerve. Here we see it in the coronal plane. This is the normal lingual nerve on the right side. This is the sectioned lingual nerve on the left side with the stump uh, and with their uh, dead end with a thickened and hyper intense signal. You can also see that in the sagittal plane with here the inferior alveolar nerve going into the mandible. Another example, this is a patient that has fibrous dysplasia and develops more and more uh, uh, pain in the 5-2 region of the left face. They did CT scan and they did a routine MRI, which showed, of course, the fibrous dysplasia, but couldn't show why the patient is now getting more and more pain. And what you see here is, once again, look, this is without gadolinium, and that's with gadolinium. Look how we even suppress the signal in the bone there, in the fibrous dysplasia. Just, it's much better if you use gadolinium. And here we see the elongated maxillary nerve. And it's elongated, so when it's elongated, it should become thinner but it's just the opposite. It's becoming thicker and it has higher signal intensity than the normal uh, maxillary nerve on the right side. And you can see that here. In this patient, you will see on the right side, look, this is the abnormal and this is the normal maxillary nerve, low signal and much, thin, uh, much thinner than the one here, which is elongated and is going through that long canal in fibrous dysplasia. So this means that this patient now gets an irritation on that elongated nerve with higher signal and develops more and more pain. So you can actually start seeing what's going on. Another example, this is a patient with a empty nose syndrome. He had sinusitis, was operated several times for polyps and so on. And in the end now, he has terrible pains in his in both cheeks uh, and also in the mandible. And nobody believes him. He has already been sent to the psychiatrist and so on. So we do this exam and what do you see? Look at that, at these thick cables. This is the maxillary nerve. And look, this is the infraorbital nerve, which is almost twice as thick as the maxillary here at the bottom of the orbit. You can see see here the nerves running at the bottom of the orbit. And here you can see the maxillary, the mandibular nerves coming through the foramen ovale, and they are also very thick, unsharp, swollen, and irregular. So here we have a neuropathy of the 5-2 and the 5-3 on both sides, secondary to repetitive surgery on the sinuses. So uh, these are the things that we couldn't see in the past, and now we find explanations for these patients. This is a patient that had a history of uh, uh, TMG pain and he had a surgery on the left side and they actually in the end put a prosthesis uh, on the TMG on the left side. Now after that he now develops a terrible pain on the left side in the TMG and they try to uh, first uh, treat that with medication, then with transcranial magnetic stimulation, uh, but still it's very difficult to uh, control the pain and they are now thinking of deep thalamic uh, brain stimulation. And the reason for it uh, couldn't be seen on routine images again, but look here, this is the masseteric branch, muscular branch of the mandibular nerve of the 5-3. And look on the left side, it's hyper intense. It's much higher in signal intensity over there, so it's irritated. And we can also see that on the movie. So let's uh, look back from the top. Here we are under the skull base. Now, if we are going to the uh, TMG, look at that. See here, you have that thick branch, masseteric branch, which is irritated, secondary to the surgery. And now the patient develops on that a neuropathy. And of course, the pain will last. And we have to find a solution to treat that. Here we see also the advantage uh, of this technique to look at the facial nerve. We already showed you that we can follow the nerve outside the temporal bone, stylomastoid foramen and the parotid. But also when you have neuritis, you will see the swollen and hyper intense nerve. It's not the enhancement that you see. We don't see enhancement on the uh, 3D crani images. We see uh, high signal and thickening of the nerve itself. So here you have the normal nerve 
outside of the temporal bone. And here you see that we have neuritis of the extracranial compartment of the facial nerve on the right side. And a patient that came in with a peripheral nerve palsy on the right side. So you see also there, it helps. Now, one of the disadvantages is that uh, if you have a lesion around the nerve, and it is destroying the nerve, then the continuity of your nerve will be gone and you won't pick up that signal of the nerve anymore. So it will be gone. So here I give you an example of that. Here you see that we have a skull base and you see the normal signal at the skull base on the right side. Here it is low signal. So here we are dealing with a metastasis. Now this metastasis is growing towards the stylomastoid foramen. This is the uh, T1 and we see on the right side, the facial nerve and here on the left side, the mastoid segment. And of course, when you inject that lineum, it will enhance. But what will happen if you see that on your nerve view? Well, on the nerve view, you will see, of course, the nerve on the normal side because the fibers are intact. But on the left side, you can follow the nerve. But once you get into the metastasis where the nerve is affected, you can no longer see it. So the normal uh, signal of the nerve is uh, disappearing because of the tumor. So this is also something we have to keep in mind. And therefore, this sequence will not be the sequence to use for perineural tumor spread. It's fantastic to see all these neuropathies, all these things that we couldn't see before, but not for perineural tumor spread. Just to show you how far we can go, this uh, last example, here we have a patient that uh, had a intubation. He had to go in intensive care. They had to intubate him and he stayed there for three weeks. And when he wake up, he woke up, they, he had uh, difficulties to speak and you see what's happening. He has atrophy of the left tongue muscles. So he, have a, he has a hypoglossal nerve problem. So we checked brainstem for infarctions, jugular for amen, cisternal segment, everything negative, also the T1, T2 in the neck, everything negative. And then of course we made here the uh, nerve, the 3D crani image. And you see the five, the 12th nerve coming and look there we have a thickening on it. And here we have another thickening on it. So probably they damaged it during the intubation. And here you see that this is the left side and you see the left hypoglossal nerve making its curve towards the hyoid and the submandibular gland with one thickening and a second thickening on the nerve, which you can also see here on the axial images on the left side. And by the way, he also had a hyper intense vagus nerve on the left side, probably uh, also due to irritation uh, during intubation. So you see that even these kinds of lesions in the neck, where we normally could never see the nerve, uh, become visible today. So in conclusion, the black blood sequence with motion sensitized driven equilibrium, MSD, E pulse was the missing technique to make 3D crani in the neck amazing. We worked already with the plexus, but we couldn't see the smaller nerves. Compressed sense was also needed to keep the acquisition time acceptable because otherwise you have sequences of 15, 20 minutes, and then the patients start to, to move. And when they move, of course, all the detail is gone again. The knowledge to run the sequence immediately after gadolinium injection was also missing before. We didn't know that, but once we picked that up, uh, suddenly all these little branches became visible. So you inject and you image immediately. Don't wait one minute, two minutes, immediately. It's the effect of the passing uh, contrast that you have to use. With that technique, now we can see the anatomy of the cranial nerves uh, in the face and neck outside the skull. And we see third, fourth, but especially fifth, seventh, ninth, tenth, eleventh, and twelfth nerve we can now follow in the neck. Pathology of the cranial nerves outside the brain becomes now easier to visualize and some previously invisible nerve changes pathology became detectable. The question is, of course, how fast will the surgeons now find a solution to treat all these patients with what we are now uh, detecting and seeing in these nerves? Okay, I hope I could convince you that this is a technique that is really uh, opening a new world in the cranial nerves of the neck. And I hope uh, that uh, you may in the future also uh, be able to use that technique. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Kasselman, for the presentation. Uh, we have some questions from our audience we would like to ask you. Um, I will ask for the first question. Do the described technique have any limitation for nerve imaging? 
Yes, there are limitations already, yeah. So, with, but that's that's it's developing. Eh? Now we are already glad we can show this, uh, which is already, in, in my opinion, amazing if you compare what we could do before. But we want more, of course. There are limits, and the limits are, of course, the coils. Eh? The coil that we have to use to see these nerves is a 32 channel or more. Uh, you need really top coils for it. If you are using a uh, regular neck coil, it won't work. And that means these head coils, they can pick up the nerves down to the mandible higher with, but not lower. So if I want to follow these nerves further down in the neck, and especially if I want to see the recurrent laryn laryngeal nerve, if I want to see the thoracic interna nerve, these ones also are very small, then I will need to have coils of the same quality also at that uh, position. And that's not there yet. So you see, we, 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 have, uh, uh, we already have very good results, but now and then we get into trouble. And uh, this, this is, uh, if you want to go for more detail uh, below the high width, we can't do that yet. And that's, what we, what, that's the next step, what we want to do. But uh, also you have to get the sequence right. Of course, uh, or sequences work on all type of machines, but uh, also if you work on different machines, uh, it's not always, uh, this, of course, this is done on a Philips machine. You can also do that on a GE or a Siemens machine. Sequences are always a little bit different and you will not always be able to have the same contrast. And I can tell you, uh, before we got this right, it took quite a while to test to try out and to change uh, subtle things in the parameters to get it right. But once it's running, it's okay. And I think uh, one of the main things is use contrast. If you don't use the contrast, you get into trouble. Okay, thank you for your answer. Uh, to continue to follow, I have a, another question uh, concerning the gadolinium injection. Do you use a partial dose, a single dose, or greater than a single dose? No. We use a single dose, a routine dose, which we uh, should also uh, do, for instance, for a, uh, a routine brain study. That's what we do. We use a, root, a routine dose, but injected. Bolus, immediately injected and start immediately. It's like contrast is coming. Uh, the same thing if you would do for an angiogram, if you would do the thoracic outlet, then you wait also for the bolus to come. It has to be the moment that the bolus passes. Then you have to start the imaging because that's where you will suppress uh, all susceptibility and all the background. And what time window do, do we have after a gadolinium ejection to keep benefits of this sequence? If you, if you run this, the sequence is five minutes. If we run the sequence, it's okay. Uh, so you start immediately and you run it for five sequences. That, so the, the contrast is still running around. If you uh, would do a second run, then it would already be worse. If you do a third run, probably you have already lost the effect of your contrast. See, it is, uh, the, the more runs you do, if you have to repeat it, uh, so that's why actually, in, in my opinion, you only have one very good shot. The second one will already be worse. And the third one, well, it's already gone. So uh, uh, five minutes, you have you have the, just the time to run one one sequence. Okay, thank you. Um, and if you have to take the image again, like due to patient uh, motion or something, is the nerve imaging worse because of the tissue enhancement? Uh, you, you, know, you, you already... Uh, it is, it is, it is, it, 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 this, this is unfortunately the case and that's why, but uh, the, the big thing is that, and that's my experience here, we, we had a lot of patients, we do a lot of patients with cranial nerve problems and sometimes they are difficult patients. These patients that get to that stage outside of the skull coming and to see it are very, are very often very motivated patients and uh, in my opinion, uh, most of them really, really lay still. They, they know it's, it, it, it is a shot they get, they get something exceptional and uh, they, they, they really are motivated before they come, which is not always the case when you have routine patients of trigeminal pain and so on, where you do the routine sequences in the brain and when you have movement. Uh, but if they move, it's gone. It's gone and you can try again, but it's second best. It will not be that good. Okay. Um, and to continue, uh, do you routinely do a delay post gado T1 fat saturation to look for enhancements? Oh, yes. M most of these patients, uh, well, first of all, most of these patients before they get to that stage already had everything. Huh? The, most often they already had another examination. Of course, what we are now doing is adding this sequence to 
the routine sequences. Uh, so in the past, it was the patients came, they didn't find anything, and then they were sent to us or, or the clinicians in our hospital say, why don't we try the, the, the 3D crani? Now we already are in the next phase, not the other hospital, the referring hospitals, but in our hospitals, very often if they send the patient for a trigeminal problem, uh, we immediately run the 3D crani. See, that's, that's the next step already, that we are getting to use it as a routine sequence. Okay, thank you. And do you think this sequence could be used for other indications? I think it is uh, the, the, the real indication of the sequence is looking for nerves. So uh, something else, I don't see immediately why you would use it. Uh, what we've seen is that uh, sometimes it is also very, very, very effective to see lymphatic uh, changes. So if you have, for instance, a lymphocell or you have uh, enlarged lymph vessels, you can see them. And this this, this is uh, also fascinating. But of course, this is just a small niche uh, and they will rarely ask for that. But it's something I remarked looking at all these images. But for the rest, it is really uh, nerve imaging. And so looking for nerve anatomy and pathology, that's that's why you use it. Okay, thank you. And uh, I will finish uh, the, the, all the questions with uh, this one. Uh, which post-processing beside uh, MIP and MPR would be useful for this indication of cranial nerve or for other indication? Well, I think it's just... I don't think you, you, you have to do anything else than you have to know your anatomy, make your MIPS, eh, because if you see the images, and, and I want to warn the people that are going to use it, if you are looking at the images that come out of the machine, it will be difficult to see the nerves. Once you run, like I've shown you in the, uh, in the parameter uh, slide, once you are using five millimeter thick slices every four 0.5 millimeter, suddenly all the nerves come there. And then, of course, you have to know your anatomy. Uh, if you look for your inferior alveolar nerve, you have to make obliques reconstructions. Coronal axial won't work, you won't see it. For the occipitals, it's different, it's more at the back. So you have to know how your nerves are running and then look for the perfect plane that follows it. As I've shown you there, we, we, we can see the 12 from the skull base down to the tongue. And then, of course, it's parasagittal and anterior port uh, run. Uh, uh, shifted uh, to the median uh, line. So uh, once you know how these nerves run, you can really look for beautiful segments that you follow all along. And it's all you need. You don't need anything else. It's just MIP, MIP overlapping and uh, angulate uh, with the 3D uh, software. That's all you need. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Kesselman. It was a great pleasure for us being with you today. Um, another webinar session is planned for next week on brain perfusion imaging uh, with Max Wintermark on Tuesday at 6 p.m. You can already register following the link in the chat. Uh, thank you, everyone. We appreciate you being here and see you next time. Thank you. Thank you very much.